Thank you so much, teachers, for all you do. That You really are a gift to our community and uh, you're a blessing to kids. So we thank you for that. Uh, my wife is a, is a teacher as well. So thank you, honey, for all that you do. And um, as a parent, seeing kids at home, just it really it has increased my appreciation for you teachers. So we just want to say thank you here at Calvary and, and uh, what a cool video and such a cool thing to see and, and to hear teachers uh, loving on their kids. So I want to say thank you to you all. Uh, it's good to be back. I'm ready to share what's on my heart for this week. And it's our last message about the resurrection. And this week I want to talk to you about purpose resurrected. Purpose resurrected at the resurrection. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, there's, there's things in life that break and that get worn down. And some people, they, they throw them away as if, you know, there is no purpose anymore. Um, that time is up for those things. Now, me personally, I see things that are broken and I want to fix them but I just don't have the ability to actually do that. There's some people who can see broken things and see the potential in them and see what they would look like restored and they have the ability to restore them. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying like I'm like terrible with my hands. I can fix things here and there, but some people have the craftsmanship to do it and make it look really good and restore it to its full potential and purpose. I'm just not that guy. Um, some people see broken things and they go, it's done. Time is up. It's purpose is up. Uh, here's the thing about God. Even when you don't see your potential, even when you don't see how you can be repurposed and that you can be restored, God does. God sees that in you, even when you don't see it in yourself. That's why God found us. God found us broken by sin. He saved us. He cleansed us. He gave us a new identity. And now he doesn't stop there. He gives us our purpose back. He has a purpose for our life. So now we're talking about how our purpose is even resurrected because of our salvation in Jesus Christ. I just find that so encouraging. And here's the thing. You were made on purpose, for a purpose. And it all began again at the resurrection. Everything changes when Jesus went to that cross and when Jesus rose again. And now people are finding out their purpose in life, their meaning in life, not just their identity, not just hope, not just salvation. The ripple effect of the resurrection continues. Listen to this amazing scripture from Ephesians 2. 10 in the New Living Translation. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created in us, he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now I want to read that in the ESV. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Wow, that's amazing. Now, this is in the context of uh, the scripture of Ephesians 1 through 10. And Ephesians 1 through 9 is talking about your salvation and what it took to save you and how we were dead in our sin. We weren't alive spiritually. We were dead. And there was no hope. And we talked about that earlier in our series. But then Jesus was offered for us. Jesus gave his life for us. He died for us so we could be restored. We could be saved. And then we find out we're children of God now. Our identity is we're a child of God. But he doesn't even stop there. He says, he says you have purpose because I've created you as a masterpiece. I've made you a masterpiece. You are my masterpiece. And long before you were even born, I had plans for you, plans to use you to do good works in your life. So I think it's pretty interesting here that right after salvation, God talks about value and purpose. At the end of this scripture of salvation, he talks about how valuable you are to him 
and how much purpose you have. Like you have a purpose in his hands. So let me share with you some takeaways and application that I see in this one powerful verse that I I want us to be encouraged by and challenged by. I see four major points here that I'm going to highlight mostly. Number one is we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. God can take messes and turn them into masterpieces. God can take any mess and turn it into a masterpiece. That's what we were. If you read Ephesians 1 through 9, it was bad. There was there was no pulse. It was dead, that kind of mess. But then Jesus changed everything, as we said before. Where there's Jesus, there's a pulse. So he can take dead things and bring them to life. He can clean up messes and make them masterpieces. And here's the thing I love about this. It appears from this scripture that God isn't embarrassed to call you his masterpiece. Like he knows everything about you. He knows what you used to do. He knows your reputation. And yet he's not embarrassed to call you his masterpiece. What is a masterpiece? I'm not much of an art guy at all. Um, like, I'm not the kind of guy that would go to D.C. or some museum in New York and walk around like, all right, it's just not me. But I was curious, what is a masterpiece? And so I looked up the most expensive piece of art ever sold, and I found out that Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi was sold for $450 billion. I'm sorry, 450 million, 450 billion. Wow, that'd be amazing. $450 million, which is still amazing. $450 million. And what is this picture? I'm gonna show you on the screen here now on the TV. Uh, This picture is, is Jesus holding his finger in the shape of a cross, and then he has a clear crystal orb representing the world. And Salvatore Mundi, uh, Mundi means savior of the world in Latin. I think it's kind of interesting that the most expensive piece of art ever sold actually has Jesus on it. Jesus is that famous. Jesus is that known. Jesus has left his fingerprint on so many things that he's even in the most expensive piece of art. And that makes sense because he is priceless. He's extremely valuable. Leonardo da Vinci also is the one who painted Mona Lisa. And uh, that has been valued today when it comes to an an insurance assessment of over $800 million. So what makes them so valuable? It's the hands. It's the hands that made them. And what the hands produced. They're both beautiful, beautiful paintings. And they're both have, they both have powerful meaning in them to the artist. And see, God, God has given you meaning and you mean a lot to God because you are his masterpiece. But maybe you're familiar with this video that's been circling around on Facebook recently. It's actually taken from a missionary from India who wrote about, it depends on whose hands it's in. And so check out this guy who expresses how important it is to understand that when it's in someone's hands, that's where it gets value. So check this out. y'all. Have you ever had somebody send you something that was just too good not to share, but maybe a little too much to type? Well, my dad sent me something the other day, and I thought it was awesome, so I was just going to share it with you. If you take this basketball right here, you put it in my hands, yeah, it's worth about 15 bucks. That's it. But you put that basketball in the hands of LeBron James, it's worth about 30 or 40 million. You take this football right here, you put it in my hands, it's worth about, I don't know, ten, eleven dollars probably. You put it in the hands of Peyton Manning, it's worth about fifty, sixty million dollars. Depends on whose hands it is. You take this golf club right here, you put it in my hands, ah, it might be worth fifty bucks, maybe. You put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, though, it's worth $80 million. You see, it depends on whose hands it in. If I have a stick in my hand, a rod in my hand, I might could beat away an animal or a wild animal or something trying to come at me. But you put it in the hands of Moses, and it parted the Red Sea. You put a slingshot in my hands. It just becomes a kid's toy. You put it in the hands of King David, and he slays the giant with it. 
see it depends on whose hand it is in. And, you know, two fishes and five loaves of bread would feed me with some bread left over. You put it in the hands of Jesus, and it feeds thousands. Depends on whose hands that it's in. If I had a couple of nails in my hand right now, I might would build you a birdhouse, if you're lucky. Might nail down a piece of wood. But you put them same nails in Jesus' hands, and it leads to salvation and eternal life for folks who love him and folks who trust him. You see, it depends on whose hands that it's in. And your worries and your cares and the things that's got you stressed out, if you leave them in your hands, that's all they're ever going to be. But if you put them same worries and cares and your problems in the hands of Christ, he's going to see you through it. He's going to take care of every need that we got. Y'all take care and have a blessed day. But just remember, it depends on whose hands that it's in. Man, that's so awesome to think that in God's hands, your value goes way up. The question is, is do you feel like a masterpiece? Let's be honest, sometimes we don't. Many times maybe we don't feel like a masterpiece. But here's the thing, God is calling you a masterpiece. And if you think about it, look what he did to make you a masterpiece. I mean, he took us from the dead spiritually to bring us to life. And he, he gave his son, Jesus, to do that. So we must be valuable, right? We must be valuable. That's my second point. We are valuable. Wow, that was a really big point, right? But it's true. We are valuable. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture says. God gave all he had to make us his masterpieces. And you could actually say in a weird way that the blood of Christ was on his brush. The blood of Christ was on God's brush, painting us, creating us in Jesus Christ. It took the blood of Christ to make you his masterpiece. You know what that tells me? That we were worth dying for. That's how valuable we are. That we're worth dying for. And if it wasn't for Jesus, we wouldn't even know our true value. And here's something really important as I was looking over the scripture this week, it really stuck out to me, is that God sees our value more than we see it in ourselves. I'm going to say that again. God sees our value more than we see it in ourselves. Like we don't even see how valuable we are as much as God sees it. And yet God knows everything we've done. And that he calls us masterpieces. What I think we do in our society is we underestimate our value. Now, I'm not saying that we should walk around with big egos and say, uh, hey, I'm God's masterpiece, so I'm, I'm really special, so treat me like that. No, I'm talking about a humble view of it, that you know, we, we, we should stay humble about this because we know where we come from. We know what God had to do. But I also think we can go the other way and we can underestimate our value. And here's the problem. When we underestimate our value, we don't live the way we should actually live. Like here's a, here's a thought I wrote down. If we think we aren't important, we won't do important things. If we think we have no value, we won't believe that God wants to do important things through us. Wow. Are we underestimating our value? Like what would you start doing for God today, tomorrow, if you saw your true potential in value? If you started seeing yourself as God's masterpiece, if you started to believe what he's done for you is to, to create you new and to make you a new person, you know, here's the thing. If you think about it, you got a blank canvas with Jesus Christ. So you get to start over when you get saved. When you give your life to Jesus, you start over. That's potential. Now, there's nothing scarier than a blank paper and, and pen or a blank screen for a pastor or a writer when we start a sermon. But there's a lot of joy and hope about a blank canvas for an artist who knows who you are and what he wants to do in you. God has already seen what you can do. You are his masterpiece and you are valuable. And because we are his masterpiece and because we are valuable, 
we have to understand that we, are, we were made on purpose for his purposes. God has a purpose for his masterpieces and God's purpose prevails. And I think we need to understand that right now too in our world going on, that God's purpose hasn't been canceled on us just because everything else has been canceled. God's purposes for us has not canceled. In fact, right now they're being cultivated. God is using this time right now to cultivate your purpose, to develop you and to work on you and to sculpt you as his piece of art. He's not done working on you. You're already a masterpiece, but he's still working and he's working through this. And here's the thing. If God's purpose prevails, it's prevailing even through this pandemic and what's going on in our world. This didn't stop God's work in your life. This didn't stop your purpose in life. It may have put a pause on it, but we're going to be back. And when we get back, what are we going to do with what God has done in us? But here's the thing you need to understand. And I think this is actually really cool that we have a purpose. And our main purpose is to display the glory and grace of God. Ephesians 3 10 through 11 says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we were meant to be displaying the power and the wisdom and the glory of God. First Peter 2, 9, I, re I referenced this last week. It says this, you are a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, as a result of being his possession, you can show others the goodness of God for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. I mean, he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light so that you could show the goodness of God. I mean, God sees you as good now. God wants to use you as good. And then check out what Paul says. Paul, um, he was actually a persecutor and he was actually sending um, Christians to prison and he was approving of their persecution and death. He was there when Stephen was stoned and he approved of it. Okay, he was against Christians but then God got a hold of him and changed his life, resurrected him, and then repurposed him to do some amazing things. And this is what he says in 1 Timothy 1, 15 through 16. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners Christ Jesus might display his immense patience or his grace as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. In other words, there are people who don't think they're worthy of being saved. And Paul's like, my life is proof that anyone is worthy of being saved. I'm on display. God's grace is on display through my life so that you know you can be saved. Wow. Wow. I mean, God, God is using Paul's life to show how loving and forgiving he is, but also how he's going to deal with the junk in your life. God wasn't happy with what he was doing, what Paul was doing to Christians. So he confronted them and he changed his heart. And Paul had to turn away from that stuff. Paul had to repent. In fact, his name was referenced from Saul to Paul because his life changed so much. So he was changed, his identity changed, and now Paul had a new purpose in life, and that was to change the world all around him. And I want you to take away something that's so important from this too. God isn't embarrassed to display his glory through us. God's not embarrassed. God doesn't see you and go, hey, you know, um, I'm not gonna let them display my glory. No, he actually is calling you a masterpiece to the point where he has made you brand new in Christ and he wants you to show his glory. He wants you to show what he can do in people's lives. God chose the church to embody the glory and the goodness and the love of God because he wants the church to show the world so that they will know.
so that they will know where to go and what to do and how to be changed by God. Here's the thing that I just want to make sure I'm clear on. Because if we're going to, if we're going to be representing God, then we need to make sure we're conducting ourselves right. And the Bible talks about how God separated us. He set us apart from this world. And to be set apart means to be holy, to not be like this world any longer, but to be like Christ. And this is what the scripture says in 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16 and 18 through 19. He says, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents on this earth. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you had inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. That's what purchased us. That's what saved us. And that, by the way, that is extremely valuable. He goes on to say in chapter 2, 11 through 12, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans or the lost or the unsaved. Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So there, there's a responsibility to, to representing God and to reflecting his glory is, is we should live holy as he is holy. I mean, it makes sense too. Like he saved us from the things of this world. So it's not good for us to be back in those and looking just like the world again. He saved us and set us apart. He's made us holy. He's made us masterpieces. We wouldn't take the Mona Lisa and drag it through the dirt. Or, or we wouldn't let someone eat spaghetti on top of an amazing painting. We would be scared that it would get dirty or messed up. Well, we should not as well treat ourselves. What Jesus did for us, we we're bought at a price, at a high price, his life. So we should treat it with, with reverence and respect what he did for us. And so remain holy and be holy and do what is holy in God's eyes because of what he did for us. And so lastly, what I see in this scripture is that we are empowered for good works. Like God chose to demonstrate his good works through you. God chose long before you were even born to do good works through you. I don't know if you ever thought of that before, but he had a plan in your life to use you to do good things. And God empowers you for it. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So what does the Bible mean, though, by good works here? Well, let me share some things real quick. Good works are believers' love offerings to God. So like the work and the fruit of Jesus in your life, when you do something for God, when you serve and when you love others and you do it for God, that's the good works. That's Jesus coming out of you. That's what he's saying. He said, you were meant to be like Jesus. You were meant to do things that Jesus did, but do it for me instead of for yourself. Don't do it for your own accolades or your own recognition. Do it for me. Another thing good works are is there are witness to the unsaved. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven, just like 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. So we're actually showing the world, when we do good things for God, we're showing the world the glory of God. And it makes sense because he takes us and changes us. And then we're doing things that we've never done before for him. People start asking questions going, man, that's a changed person right there. Also, good works are inspiring and edifying examples for the body of Christ. When you do good works, it inspires me. It, it pushes me. It helps me live holy. It helps me do what God has, has made me to do. It keeps me on track, on purpose. 
And then, and then good works are the means by which we minister to the needs of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, our fellow believers. I love what Titus 3.14 says, our people must learn to do good by meeting the urgent needs of others. Then they will not be unproductive. So your good works are meant to help one another as believers. And let me tell you something, you have been amazing during this season uh, that we've been going through, this trying time financially and physically and emotionally. Calvary has been pouring out money and time and efforts and you've been so brave. And I'm, I'm super proud as a church to call Calvary our church, to call Calvary you know, my church, my family, my spiritual family and community because the stories that are coming out and uh, what you guys are doing is incredible. And we look forward to hearing the stories that you send into us about what God's been doing in your life. We wanna hear about testimonies of the good things that God's been doing in your life and as well as good things you've been able to do for others. It's gonna be incredible to hear these stories because we're seeing that in the midst of all these difficult times, hope isn't canceled. You know, identity isn't canceled. Purpose isn't canceled. Good works isn't canceled. The church just keeps going. I mean, we've been blessed so much personally as a family, but even as a church whole, I'm watching the blessings just pour in to this church so that we can pour it out and help people in need. So I give you a, a standing ovation, church, that you are demonstrating this scripture, that God has changed you so you could do good works. And here's a question to think about. What good works have you seen flowing from your life since salvation? I mean, what were you like before and what are you like now? Before Christ, you know, your BC days, maybe you weren't as loving and kind to people. Maybe you lived for yourself. Uh, maybe it was, it was all about you or, or maybe you weren't a blessing to people. But because of Christ, man, he's changed your attitude towards people, your love, your sensitivity, your kindness, going off the charts and helping people, your, your sacrificial love for others. I mean, that's what God can do in people. I think that's the, the, just the huge takeaway for me out of all of this is God doesn't just stop at, at salvation. God changes a person like 180, a complete makeover here. I mean, he completely resurrects us and he's not done. He's still working on things and it takes a life journey to do that. But he can take someone who's completely a mess and turn them into a masterpiece and to the point that they're doing good things for others, doing good works for God, not even for themselves. They're not trying to take the glory for it at all. I mean, that's incredible. That's the power of the resurrection. That's the power of Jesus Christ in someone's life. So God has turned your life around and he's not even done with you yet. And God planned long ago to use you for his glory, to show the world what he can do in and through his masterpiece. So I hope you're encouraged today that not only has hope resurrected, not only have you resurrected out of death, spiritual death, not only have your, has your identity resurrected, now you know who you truly are in God's eyes and who you were truly made to be. Now you're learning you were truly made to serve God, that you have a purpose and a meaning in this life, that you were meant to do something for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I mean, who gets to say that? Who gets to say that God wants to use them? We do. Who gets to say that, the, that the, the Lord and the King of the universe, the creator of this entire universe wants to use them? We do. We should count it a privilege to be used by God. And we get to do it now. In the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic crisis, whatever you wanna call it, in the midst of whatever's going on in our world right now, purpose hasn't canceled. Purpose actually is, is being even resurrected even more in our lives. And we're watching the church rise up. We're watching believers rise up. We're watching people find purpose. That's incredible. So let's look for it. Let's look for ways that God wants to use us. We're so valuable to him. 
He's called us a masterpiece. He's got a plan for us. He planned it long ago. Before you were even saved or born, he had a plan to use you. What is he gonna do through your life? What is he gonna do through your life? What has he been doing? We wanna praise God for that. Let me pray. God, we thank you so much. You've changed our lives full circle, 180 degrees. God, you've, you've made us a complete different person in Christ. A blank canvas. The past is gone. The new has come. And so now, God, we want to be all that you've called us to be, all that you've died and saved us to be. We want to be that. God, help us when we don't think we have a purpose. Maybe we don't even see the value in ourselves and we don't see that we have purpose. God, I pray you would help us to see it. God, help us not to to look at our inadequacies, but to look at how you are enough. You are enough. And it's it's you in us that we can even do any of these things. Philippians 2.13, for it is your power working in us to do what you've asked us to do. God, we thank you for that. Lord, I just pray you be with our church during this time. Give us wisdom and guidance, discernment, patience to endure what we're going through, and faith and trust in you. You got this, God. You've been there all along. And we thank you for what you've been doing in us this entire season. We thank you for your word today. May it sink in deeply and change lives. I pray you would call people home. May they see that you love them, that you forgive them of their sin, help them to see that sin and confess it to you and to ask you to forgive them and save them. And God, I pray that you would just repurpose after you restore them, repurpose them to use them for your plans. Help us to know what that is, God. Show us specific purposes and help us to do your basic purpose, which is to glorify you and to love others and to do good works for others and for you. God, help us to live those out. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you next week.